great. Uh, colleagues, it's uh, wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my first year here, we met quite often, but uh, as there's been less change more recently, we haven't had the opportunity. So uh, I was delighted that the council meeting gives us the opportunity. Now, sitting uh, next to me is James Cocaine, who you all know is our representative in New York. And I asked him to join uh, me up here so that he could describe for you some of what we are trying to do to make ourselves, uh, not so much just to make ourselves more policy relevant, most of that goes on away from New York, but how we translate our new interest in policy relevance into uh, the UN system. Uh, but first, a word or two about the council meeting. Uh, you know, uh, or perhaps some of you don't, that the council actually has changed quite a lot, not so much in terms of membership, but in structure, particularly the number of members. After I got here, uh, having an experience, as did John de Boer, of a smaller, more effective board, uh, in conversation with the Council, we agreed that, uh, if possible, uh, UNU should move towards having a smaller board that could meet more often and oversee us more effectively than a large board meeting only once a year was able to do, because I'd have to say that the oversight was, uh, I think, very serious on, on behalf of members of the council, but meeting only once a year, there's only so much you can do. Uh, and uh, with a lot of help from James, actually, in New York and his colleagues, um, that was one of the few elements of reform the General Assembly accepted late last year. So we are now down to a board of 12 designated members appointed by the Secretary General and three ex officio members, one from the office of the Secretary General or at least nominated by the Secretary General who is a new Assistant Secretary General of the UN called Thomas Gass who was appointed too late to join us here. Uh, secondly, UNESCO, Chan Tang, who is excellent and who has been the delegate of the Director General for UNESCO on our board for a while. He also didn't join us here for this meeting. And finally, uh, UNITAR, uh, which uh, uh, joined us in the form of the head of the UNITAR office uh, in uh, Hiroshima. Uh, the excellent Miho, and we were happy to have her with us. Uh, I think, uh, frankly, one reason that uh, neither the Secretary General's office nor UNESCO were represented at the Council is they aren't too worried about us. Uh, but we've made the point uh, that uh, if people are appointed to the board in ex officio capacity, we want them to come at least once a year probably no more than that, but once a year. So it was a smaller group. Uh, it's a very strong group of individuals. Our chair, who many of you have met, Mohammed Hassan, is absolutely outstanding, very highly regarded uh, globally, and rightly so. And impressively, uh, whenever I need to consult him, he always makes himself available within 24 hours for a phone call or uh, some other form of consultation. So he's tremendously dedicated, very wise, and often when I don't know what to do, I simply call him, and his advice is just excellent. Um, and he's very highly regarded by the rest of the council. Uh, uh, so what was the main point of the council meeting this time? It was actually an important meeting because we had two documents uh, before us uh, that were of more than routine uh, import. One was an independent external evaluation of UNU. Um, 
It didn't contain any surprises in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of UNU. I think we all know those. But it did contain a number of recommendations, most of which we agreed with, but one or two of which we were less keen on. And we were very frank about that with the council, uh, that uh, uh, we thought some of the recommendations were very good, one or two not so good, and we would not, with the uh, agreement of the council, be acting on those. And uh, one that uh, we will pocket in a way that could be very useful in the future, but that we don't need to make use of right now. So the evaluation was dealt with uh, quite quickly. Uh, it's a good document in the sense that it's quite short, very readable and you would all recognize you and you in the terms of the evaluation, uh, but perhaps it was methodologically uh, not as exciting as it might have been because it was based primarily on interviews with a large number of people who knew you and you, including our students, including a number of you in the room, but the problem when you have 200 interviews is how do you digest it and make something punchy out of it? So it suffered a little bit from that. The second document we had before us uh, was a draft strategic plan. You may remember that um, uh, we operate in roughly uh, five-year plan cycles. Uh, we started work on the strategic plan last year as a bottom-up exercise, starting with the institutes telling us what their own uh, plans were and discussing their plans with them at the council meeting in Rome uh, in the middle of this year, in May. Uh, some of the plans were endorsed as very good. Others were told that they needed to do better or differently. But that provided us with a very good foundation on which to draft a UNU-wide uh, strategic plan, uh, which was done uh, in the late summer and uh, early fall developing an outline of ideas that we had also discussed with the council in May. So we knew what the reactions of the council were to our ideas. Most of them were in agreement, but on some of our ideas, uh, they weren't fully in agreement, and we took that uh, on board, of course, because we are governed by the council. Um, Again, there was a premium on being short and straightforward uh, in the strategic plan and crystal clear about uh, areas of focus, how we work, um, and uh, also indirectly what we will not do. Uh, there was also much greater clarity from the council about our academic programs than we had seen uh, in the past. I should add that the Council is supportive of our academic programs, uh, but does not feel we exist to uh, execute academic programs. There are lots of other institutions around the world that can do that. Um, they understand that we believe we are in an experimental phase, particularly with our master's programs in Bonn, in Maastricht, and here. Uh, and coming out of this, you'll see in the strategic plan that the council approved a sense from the council that in the long run, doctoral programs may make more sense for us than master's programs. Why? Because doctoral programs are always fully integrated into the research agenda of the department or institution they are a part of, whereas master's programs aren't. And if you're primarily about research, either uh, curiosity-driven research or policy-relevant research, that actually means that doctoral students can be a resource rather than a burden. 
So uh, that was there, um, that discussion we had. But on balance, uh, the institutes, including our own institute, are positive about the academic programs, and the council was uh, pleased to hear that. Um, and I said that we would revisit the academic programs in depth in probably three years to decide which ones we keep and which ones we don't. Uh, but uh, we don't need to do that yet, and we probably shouldn't do that yet, because they haven't yet had sufficient time uh, to find their own, um, how can I say, comfort level, and we aren't yet in a position to evaluate them fully, in part because uh, as far as the evaluator is heard, our students are quite happy at the moment, overall, with the programs. Um, now, uh, what else can we say? Um, first of all, uh, we're becoming a lot more serious about management than uh, perhaps we were. Not management in a day-to-day -day sense, because in a day-to-day -day sense, uh, UNU has always been well managed, as far as I can make out, in terms of financial management, overall management. UNU is probably consistently one of the best managed UN agencies. Rather, um, to bring a sense of stronger commitment to management, we have wanted to empower the advisory boards and committees of our institutes to advise the institutes not just on their research, not just on the academic programs, but also in terms of fundraising, what sorts of people they need for the programs, not to be involved in hiring, but the profile of people uh, that they want to do the work. And my experience is since we started thus empowering the advisory boards to have views and share them on those dimensions of our institutes, it's made a very significant and very positive difference. I've seen that in two or three of the institutes already, and so I'm quite optimistic that as that becomes more generalized, um, uh, there will be dividends from uh, that approach. But overall, the Council has few worries about management at the UN. The Finance and Audit Committee of the Council is a strong one. It uh, gets detailed briefings from Francois, Su Ching, and others on our financial position, on human resources, and how our approach to human resources management has been evolving. They've been closely consulted. Uh, the major decisions have been made by the Council or endorsed by the Council. So the Council is pretty well up on all of that and quite comfortable with all of that. But if you have questions on it, we're very happy to come back to that um, in our uh, period of exchange. Um, one uh, new development, uh, which has been slow moving but steady, the Council, of course, was interested in the Center for Policy Research, which uh, they agreed to the creation of 18 months ago, but of course took some time to create. However, since the summer, CPR has been with us here, and so the Council was very interested in hearing from Sebastian on uh, early work in the Council and very interested also in hearing from James how uh, the Institutes and CPR are all channeling through New York in effect at the moment. Some other UN conferences and locations but mostly New York, more of their work. And that's a bit what I think James will be sharing with us here uh, later. Um, but, but again, great sense of interest in the Council. Some institutional developments we, were, we shared with the Council. 
First, uh, as you know, um, uh, nearly a year ago now, we were able to agree with the authorities in Algeria on the creation of an institute there, which will come with a sizable endowment from the financial endowment from the government of Algeria. Um, it's been relatively slow to get Actually, the thing that has happened quickest is the money started flowing in. But uh, to get our site done up, to get staffed up has taken a little bit of time. Those of you who read The Economist will have seen recently that we're looking for the first director of that institute in Algeria and also a new director of our institute in Bruges because the, the term of office of the current director there is up. Um, we have also been in discussions in uh, Senegal with the government, mainly through our institute in Maastricht. Uh, we're very far down the track there, but with anything involving money, you never know until the deed is signed whether you're going to be successful or not. So we're much further down that track, but we still need um, a, a bit more consultation within the government of Sen Senegal. The government signed a, a, a host country agreement, is an agreement in principle, but until there's an agreement overall, uh, I still wouldn't sell the farm on that basis. Uh, in Mozambique, uh, the operating unit that uh, has been designed to work closely with our institute in Dresden, which works on the integrated management of soil, water, and waste, again, fairly slow progress, and the director of our institute in uh, Dresden will be going to uh, Mozambique shortly to try to find out what has slowed down the process and see if we can resolve it. Uh, and I hope we can because the opportunity to work there would be great. But on the other hand, if it doesn't work for Mozambique, Flores can, uh, the Dresden Institute, can find other partners in uh, East Africa to work with. Our, uh, you may remember that our institute in Macau was frozen about 18 months ago uh, for reasons of essential internal dysfunction, which had developed over many years. Um, not everything that was going on in uh, Macau was bad. In fact, a lot of the scientific work was quite good. Uh, and probably the strongest program, we uh, hived off, and it has resettled in Portugal since uh, basically May of this year. It's a program on e-governance, the relationship between governments and others and citizens uh, providing government services or governance uh, more generally. Uh, they've been an excellent program for quite a while and it would have been a shame to see that wrap up. Uh, so it's off with new funding to, we think, a good start in Portugal. Uh, in fact, we're quite optimistic about that. Uh, on Macau itself, um, the advisory board, which is a highly expert, very dedicated one, uh, has gone through two uh, cycles of seeking to hire a director. The first cycle wasn't uh, successful, partly because we had set the uh, bar quite high, which we continued to do in the second cycle, but partly also because Macau's a very particular sort of place, and uh, not everyone uh, having visited Macau necessarily wants to live there. Personally, I'd be delighted to live there, but it isn't everybody's cup of tea. Um, so uh, the job was offered to two very promising candidates in the first round. 
One for family reasons, the other more Macau related ultimately didn't take us up on the offer. Second round, uh, really very strong candidates and I'm glad to say that uh, the top choice has accepted our office. Uh, a guy called uh, uh, Michael Best, I think, who is at Georgia Tech, one of the top institutions on computing in the world. And the subject area of the institute has been redefined uh, from simply information technology to computing and society, a broader mandate oriented towards the developing world. Um, so these are some of uh, the institutional developments. Uh, and uh, without any guarantee of success, I should mention that we continue to pursue the possibility of an institute in Brazil that's been on uh, the cards for quite a bit of time. Uh, our Brazilian council member is keen, elements in the Brazilian government are keen, but Brazil is a complicated place. We've um, entered into conversations with uh, a potential partner at one of China's top universities which in turn has been in conversation with the Chinese government. This is making its way forward because we would like, uh, as well as Macau, to have something exciting in China itself. Um, we'll be starting gently to explore possibilities in India now that the election, national election in India is over. Uh, and we're also in discussion with a potential partner government in the Gulf. Uh, uh, so again, we continue to think of expanding each time with a partner prepared to make a significant investment in uh, UNU. Because I've come to the conclusion that creating institutes that are not endowed, that do not have an endowment, is exciting in the short term, but in the long term, not a good idea. So as long as I am here, we will not be creating any institutes that are not financially endowed and thus that uh, are at the mercy of short-term uh, funding. Um, uh, UNU uh, IAS, which many of you work in, of course, uh, one important thing that slightly alarmed me when I got here was that uh, a process had not yet been undertaken to get the master's programs in Japan accredited. I'm glad to report that process of accreditation for the master's uh, in the science of sustainability has been going on for the past year or nearly year, and we're optimistic it will produce accreditation early in the new year for that. Our master's programs in Maastricht and Bonn are already accredited, so there's no problem uh, there. Uh, and IAS, I mean, is, is a very exciting institute. It's our largest institute, very well led uh, by uh, Kazu Takemoto with a very dedicated new advisory board, very lively new advisory board that met recently, strongly supports Kazu in the directions he's taking uh, the institute in. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Kazuhiko Takeuchi, who of course knows a great deal about IAS with us as our senior vice rector in which he plays uh, an outstanding role. Now James, over to you to talk a bit about uh, policy relevant research work, uh, how that can be refracted to the UN through your office, but perhaps also uh, as you're sitting here and as you work very closely with CPR, on how CPR also has become quite involved in your work. Great, thank you, Rector. If you look at Article 1 of the UN University Charter, there are two aspects of, it how, of how it defines our work which are important for the small team that we have sitting in New York representing the university. First, part of that provision 
says that our mandate is, amongst other things, to work on the, quote, pressing global problems of concern to the United Nations and its agencies, unquote. And another part of that provision says that we have a role in disseminating knowledge to those same groups. But how are we supposed to know what the pressing global problems of concern to the UN and its agencies are? How do we know what they're concerned about? Well, that's a big part of the job that my team in New York has, to help all of the university, all of its institutes, the rector's office, all the different components, figure out what are the pressing global problems of concern to the UN and its agencies from week to week, month to month. Now, policy processes in New York and elsewhere sometimes go at a different speed to research processes. The questions get asked in a very different way and on a very different rhythm than the answers are forthcoming to those questions. So there is a, a challenge there for all of us involved in policy relevant research work to figure out how to both identify the questions and present the answers in a way that will allow us effectively to discharge that second part of our mandate, disseminating knowledge. Because disseminating knowledge is not just about putting the knowledge in front of the policymakers, presenting it to them on a page or a computer screen. It's about getting them to actually understand the ideas that are contained or developed through our research to integrate that internally, to understand it internally and to feed it into their own policy design. The language we use in the research community in academia is often quite different than the language used in the policy community. The way we understand certain concepts, the way we understand even certain problems is often quite different. So a central part of our job in New York is to help all of you disseminate the knowledge that you've developed in ways that will get uptake, that will be understood, that will find traction, that will create meaning amongst the UN uh, policy processes in the UN and its agencies. So let me tell you a little bit about our strategy at the office in New York for carrying out this quite complicated translate, translation function. The first thing that I tell people in New York and in the UN when I'm trying to explain our role, and it's really a summation of our strategy, is we are here to be helpful. And what I mean by that is the university is here to be helpful. That's why we were created in the first place. But also, more specifically, our office is there to be helpful to the UN and its agencies in accessing the knowledge that you and others have created and figuring out what it means for policy. That falls into certain different types of activity that our office can carry out for you, to be helpful to you. The first one is what I would call strategic intelligence. So how are you supposed to know, sitting here in Tokyo or in other places where UNU is working, what are those pressing global problems of concern to the UN? Part of the way you can do this is through your own research and due diligence, but part of it is also to work with us in the office in New York to figure out how certain issues are being discussed, how certain problems are being analysed, what kinds of policy options are on the table to deal with the problems that you're interested in. Let me give you a couple of specific examples of how our office has begun to do that. One thing we've been doing is very closely following the sustainable development process that I know is of interest to probably many of you and certainly many of our other institutes. The whole discussion around what the post-2015 development framework is going to look like. That's been a very complicated, frankly quite messy policy process in New York. Many of you will know there has been an open working group of not only member states but also other interested stakeholders discussing this. Now the Secretary General has just produced his own set of ideas through what is called the Synthesis Report and now we're about to go back into intergovernmental discussion in 2015. It's very complicated, very opaque, very hard to follow for even for people in New York. 
But part of what we can do is help capture the key themes, the key trends that are emerging, and feed them back to the institutes. So our office has begun producing what we call situation reports. Roughly every month or two, when there's an interesting new trend emerging in this discussion, and sending those to the uh, key directors and leaders of the UNU institutes. And they are then able to uh, digest those and feed that thinking into their own institute's work. That's one example of the kind of strategic intelligence we can offer. Another place where we can have insight into these important strategic trends is through the rector's participation in what is called the Chief Executives Board for Coordination. The UN, as you know, is really a big decentralized family of institutions. And twice a year, the leaders of those different autonomous institutions come together for a coordination meeting to think about the common challenges and uh, problems they're facing and coordinate their policy and programming responses. This is called the Chief Executives Board. It meets twice a year and the rector is a participant in those meetings. It's an unusual opportunity for us as a knowledge institution to get a bird's eye view of how all the different operational and normative institutions within the UN are understanding and responding to certain problems. So it's both an opportunity for us to, to read the landscape, see what's going on, and feed that knowledge back to the directors, and an opportunity, frankly, also to begin to uh, identify opportunities for disseminating knowledge that we are producing within UN University. To do that, we have to think more tactically, not just at the strategic level, but at the tactical level, about how we take specific ideas, specific reports, specific um, products that you've developed through your research and where we carefully insert it into the UN system. And this is the second function that our office can play, what I would call tactical intelligence, by which I mean helping you figure out exactly how and where to interface with the very complex UN animal. And we do that, for example, by providing guidance on how to organize certain kinds of meetings effectively in New York. Because the New York community is a very unusual community. It's very busy, as you know. Any of you who've visited New York, it's a little bit neurotic at times. Everybody's rushing. They always need to be somewhere else or attending some other meeting. And that's very much the case in the UN community as well. Put those two things together, the UN and New York, and you have a recipe for quite a short attention span on the part of policymakers. So getting complex ideas across to them is an art, and it requires a really a, quite a lot of local knowledge and a lot of attention to the detail of how you present information. Again, that's part of our role, to help you understand how to organize your events, how to format uh, your products in a way that will get maximum uptake in that particular community and other parts of the UN system. We've begun doing this kind of thing with a number of institutes. Uh, we had a very successful annual lecture organized by the World Institute for Development Economics Research, WIDA, uh, in New York uh, about uh, three or four weeks ago now. Uh, we've worked with many other institutes to organize events in New York, both with missions and at, uh, at the, the United Nations headquarters itself. And we are, as I said, here to be helpful. So if you, in your work in the future, think that there's an opportunity for you to interface helpfully and productively with the UN, take the idea, please, to your leadership discuss it with them, and if they think it's appropriate, they'll bring it to us for a discussion about how we can help you to get your ideas across to the UN community. The final part of what we do in uh, New York is to help identify gaps in the policy, uh, in the process of providing research analysis that feeds in to policy discussions in New York and then work to find sources of supply to fill those gaps. The Center for Policy Research that the Rector mentioned is already becoming a very important part of that discussion in New York, despite being based here in Tokyo. 
And I want to give you a couple of specific examples of how they're already very quickly being seen in New York as a very important provider of that kind of analysis and timely policy-relevant policy research. Some of you will know that the Secretary General has initiated what is called the High-Level Independent Panel on Peace Operations, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I like to use the acronym, which is conveniently HIPPO. Um, it's also appropriate because, as many of you know, most peacekeeping happens uh, in Africa, where the, the hippo, the hippopotamus, is a very fearsome and quiet animal, but it, if it's roused to anger, it can become quite dangerous. It's probably a good way to think of the panel, too. The panel, or the hippo, uh, knee, has a mandate over the next seven or eight months to come up with new big picture ideas about how peace operations will take place in the future. In order to do that, they need research inputs at the beginning to understand what are the major trends in violent conflict that they're facing, what are the major trends in peacekeeping, what are the challenges that peacekeepers are facing. So the UN has turned to the research community to provide it that analysis. And the Center on Peace Operate, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm getting my <laughs> acronyms mixed up. The Center for Policy Research was asked to provide one of the key uh, papers at the very beginning of the panel's work. And this was a paper on major recent trends in violent conflict. They put that to, uh, paper together in very short order and then Sebastian Einsiedel, the director of the center, was asked to be the only external actor to attend the panel's first meeting to present that research. So very quickly we see there that there is demand from the UN for this kind of policy relevant research from United Nations University. Partly on the strength of the success of that initiative, the center has now been asked to take a key role in marshalling research for another review that's about to get underway, led by member states, which focuses on peace building rather than peacekeeping. Our role in uh, New York is simply to help the center plug in where it needs to into those processes, to support it engaging policymakers and officials in New York, to support it identifying through strategic intelligence those opportunities and through tactical intelligence figuring out solutions that can exploit those opportunities. So we're very hopeful about the future of the university's engagement with the UN. We've seen a tremendous response from all of the institutes, I would say, uh, to this call over the last two years to engage more directly with the policy processes in the United Nations. There's plenty more we can do. We're excited in my small office of just three people uh, to be able to work with all of you uh, to be helpful to the United Nations because ultimately that's why we exist, uh, to help the world address its most pressing global problems through research. And it's a great honor to have had the chance to come and speak with all of you today to tell you a little bit about what we've been up to. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, James. A couple of other uh, points on the Center for Policy Research. Part of what they were busy doing during the summer uh, when the center was principally Sebastian himself was organizing uh, the Climate Summit's thematic panel on the economic dimension of climate change. And so this, uh, what turned out to be actually the most attractive of the pan thematic panels of the summit, uh, not easy to pull together, very competitive amongst people who wanted to be on the panel. Uh, but to cut a long story short, it was extremely successful. And it was something we were well placed to do because we were not perceived as one of the UN agencies that would take advantage of this simply to promote itself, which a number of UN agencies uh, sometimes uh, do. Uh, the second thing I'd say is that successful think tanks, as uh, CPR already is, but as I hope it will be even more in the future, 
uh, work with a lot of partners, partners of convenience and sometimes more long-term partners, depending on the issues that you're working on. And UNU in general needs to think more in terms of partnerships than it does, frankly. Uh, it's not so fabulous to be UNU. There are many other fabulous institutions in the research world, in the academic world, and we make ourselves more important and more relevant by keeping very good company, by keeping very high quality company and partnering with that very high quality uh, company rather than just being on our own. On our own, truth be told, we're not very significant. But if we work with others who are very good at what they do, then our work can be significant in partnership with them. So on the UN policy front, for example, there are a number of pre-existing think tanks that are pretty good at that, uh, International Peace Institute, Security Council Report, Center uh, for International Cooperation in New York, in Geneva, there are a bunch of them, Humanitarian Dialogue, I could name a number of them to you. So we can make ourselves better by working with them. Thinking that we are fabulous because we are the UN University is our enemy. It isn't our friend, that type of thinking. So uh, that is something we're getting underway in the policy sphere. But also I'm happy to say here in the academic sphere in Japan, our master's program is jointly taught with the University of Tokyo. This is very good for us. Frankly, the University of Tokyo could do without UNU. Uh, I'm not sure UNU can do without the University of Tokyo in Japan. So we have to think of ourselves in a much less insular way and think of ourselves as a very small actor in a very large ecosystem struggling for relevance and excellence alongside much bigger inhabitants of that ecosystem and for whom partnership with some of the big players or some of the best players is going to be very important. Partnership isn't easy. Human beings were, uh, it seems, created with a competitive gene in their DNA but actually, the partnering gene is much more valuable than the competing gene, believe you me. So uh, we're going to aim to be partnering much more, perhaps, than we have in the past, but particularly in the policy sphere, uh, where I think uh, there are so many others who are bigger than us, uh, have a lot more experience than us, but who find our position within the UN very attractive to them. What we have to offer them is we are in the UN, and they are not. So uh, we need to make sure that uh, in, in a strategic way, uh, we identify what is our great strength, uh, and then that we are also open to the great strengths of others, such that partnerships work well for all of those involved. I think we should stop here and uh, open ourselves to any remarks by any of you on the council meeting on how we work uh, or any comments you have for us, that'd be great. As you know, in the public, uh, public conversation series, the success of it depends on the audience, not on the speakers. So we require you to be an active audience <laughs> today. Kazu, please. Just uh, quickly as the active uh, audience, <laughs> the, uh, um, Quickly, a uh, strategic plan uh, was uh, endorsed, uh, the approved by the council, and uh, our staff member can reach or uh, the access uh, the, uh, that uh, the outcome uh, quite shortly. It's a good point. Anybody here can actually access it any time they want to because we can make copies of it very quickly. 
but our aim is to have it on the website of the university within a day or two. Uh, because it is finalized, it is approved by the council. Don't expect it to contain any great surprises for any uh, of you. There are no great surprises in it. But it does give a very firm sense of the direction that we're going in, and also, as a result, the directions we're not going in. So I do hope that you all uh, read it with interest, and having read it, if you have any questions, or comments, uh, please let us know. You can do it directly by being in touch with David Passarelli. Uh, you can do it directly by being in touch with me, for that matter. Um, but you can also speak with uh, Kazu or Professor Takeuchi when you see him. Professor Takeuchi was at the meeting of the council throughout. Kazu, you were there for quite a bit of it, or some of it. The council, by the way, had the pleasure this time more than any other since I've been here uh, of meeting quite a number of colleagues from uh, UNU headquarters. They enjoy that, clearly. And so we'll try to make sure that the next time the council meets in Tokyo, not quite sure when that will be, that there's, again, another opportunity for council members to meet uh, a number of you. Please, John de Boer, who is uh, probably known to all of you, but he's one of the new members of CPR. Great, thanks very much. Uh, so I think you know, both of you have mentioned quite rightly that uh, UNU Institute produce solid research uh, on particular topics. And I think uh, one takeaway from my research trip to New York, as well as from your talk here, is about thinking collectively uh, across the set of institutes on a number of issues. David, you mentioned the climate change, which provided an opportunity for a number of institutes around the union to collectively think about how we can perhaps influence that agenda, support that agenda moving forward. I've been involved on the urban front trying to do that, but my question to perhaps both of you, moving forward, looking ahead, 2015 and 2016 for the UN are very busy years, years full of symmetry, if you will. Do you see any particular agenda items on the horizon where you, you perhaps would like CPR and others to seize an opportunity for collective engagement? Well, I'll, I'll try and give an answer, but I'd be very happy if uh, James would disagree and present <laughs> his own uh, answer. Um, the first thing to say is the UN has too much activity over the next two years. It can't cope, and one of the risks for the UN is all of these summits, all of these conferences are going to turn into the international equivalent of white noise. People will lose interest and won't be able to tell the difference between a summit on humanitarian action from uh, a review of peacekeeping, for example. So that is something, the UN is very bad at pacing itself. It is over busy and not thoughtful enough. The uh, Sustainable Development Goal process, for example, has had a lot more activity and consultation than it has produced light on development to date. Although I think the Secretary, I thought the high level panels report was analytically a very good one about a year and a bit ago. And I think the Secretary General synthesis a report, once you remove the usual blah blah, is an interesting way, it, unfortunately very close to the end rather than up front, of distilling how one might think of uh, what's important in the development agenda over the next few years. But frankly, the public isn't going to trouble itself to do any of that. The UN has to learn to be much clearer, to select, uh, rather than to want to be everything to everybody, to so be much more selective, I think, because the public is very busy with Beyonce and other uh, sources of amusement. The UN cannot monopolize public opinion. Indeed, the UN has a lot of a difficulty attracting 
public interest. And that lesson has not yet been learned uh, clearly. So that's a big problem in my view. As for us, and for CPR in particular, but I think the same thing applies to IAS, we have to learn not always to do the same thing over and over again. That's one thing that's wrong with the General Assembly of the UN. If you look at the agenda in the year 1990 and the agenda of the General Assembly in the year 2014, you've got roughly the same agenda with uh, a few new items out of 250, and perhaps one or two have been uh, retired. Disastrous way to operate. CPR is lucky because it's new, so it can choose a new agenda for uh, itself. And I think it's always a combination of luck uh, the talent of the people in an institution, luck is quite important, by the way, talent within an institution, and having a market for what you're doing. If you do great work, but there's no market for your great work, um, it's very, very difficult to succeed. And that's where James can be helpful. He has a sense of the marketplace, at least in New York, and we have friends in Geneva who have a sense of the marketplace there. Uh, we have friends in, and an institute in Bonn who have a sense of that. So uh, I think being sensitive to what the outside world might be interested in hearing from us is important, rather than simply the curiosity-based research that many academics do extremely well. Nobody created UNU to generate curiosity-based research, I'd, I'd have to say. I think all of us should feel free to play with interest, uh, issues that we're interested in, always having in mind the utility to UNU. So for example, uh, because it matters to Japan, try and think of a country that really matters to Japan in its geostrategic positioning. Uh, the least conventional, but perhaps most important partner of Japan in Asia is India. But actually, the India-Japan relationship is uh, a successful one diplomatically, but underdeveloped in a number of other ways, including economically, relative to potential. So knowing this, and knowing interesting interlocutors in India, think it thinking it would be fun to find the best people in Japan on India, just as we knew where to find the best people in India on the relationship with Japan, we got a small project going on the India-Japan relationship with funding from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. This is actually something that's quite useful to both India and Japan, and these are two pretty important countries. It's not like, I don't know, Canada and El Salvador exploring their mutual interests. So that was something we're doing simply out of a sense of, well, we're sitting in Tokyo, what might be something that could be useful here? It has no application in the UN whatsoever, except that both countries want to play a bigger role in the UN, and you won't be surprised to hear that the UN came up quite often in the first authors meeting of the process we had because they both want to play a much bigger role at the UN, and they're both very frustrated with the role they can play currently. Uh, so for institutes, for CPR, I think it's a mix of thinking about what you want to do, but there's probably more you'd like to do than there is time to do it and people to do it. Thinking about the marketplace, trusting in luck, because you don't have much alternative but to trust in luck, uh, that uh, what you decide to work on, uh, having done some market research, will turn out to be useful. Some of the areas, John, that you've been interested in for a while, 
uh, the process of urbanization globally uh, as both opportunity but also containing elements of risk. Um, in the promotion of a global, not so much global security, but security within countries, uh, urban zones are going to be more and more important. I think this issue could have real uh, traction. It's under-colonized. UNU needs to go on looking for issues that are under-colonized but important as long as we think there is a market for them. And so I assume you've been doing your market research and uh, getting there. James, over to you. Thanks, Rick. I think sometimes, John, there's a perception that uh, working on policy re relevant issues and working on long-term academic inquiry is a zero-sum game. There's a certain truth to that. I mean, there are only certain, so many hours in the day, only so many people working in research organizations. You have to make choices about how to allocate scarce resources. But I also think that that can be overplayed. Um, there is a real risk that there, there is so much summitry mm -hmm. in the next two years that if we focus too much on that, we will lose sight of the longer term research issues that we can help uh, answer or address. On the other hand, um, we know that there are certain pressing global problems that are going to be with us for decades to come. Climate change, disaster risk reduction, uh, conflict issues, organized crime issues, they're going to remain relevant. So the challenge is to find a research agenda that develops knowledge cumulatively over time, but pro produces outputs that can be fed in to the policy processes as they arise. That's where the luck comes in, that's where the market research comes in and so on. I think what we've seen in New York is that there are certain ways of framing issues that are likely to come up in the next two to three years, where ongoing research within UNU can be fed in through those lenses, through those frames. The urban agenda is definitely one that's going to be high on both the, uh, in both the summitry process and in terms of a need for sustained collective research. Uh, youth employment is emerging as a key cross-cutting issue across the work of many different kinds of UN agencies, both operational and normative. The role of big data in development is another key one that's emerging as something with a potential market uptake in the really six month to two year time frame, but it's again going to stay with us for decades to come. So these are the challenges for all of you, to figure out a research agenda that you can be helpful on, that will be of utility to your organizations and of interest and curiosity to you, but also to keep an eye on the market opportunities in the short term. And that's part of what we were talking about in terms of strategic intelligence. We can find, help you find those opportunities, but then it's up to you to figure out whether you want to sell a particular product into that market. I don't think it's and it's for. Uh, I don't think it's productive to have a top-down approach to this, and it's not one that I've seen encouraged in the university. Ultimately, it's up to the institutes and individual researchers to figure out if cross-institute collaboration is going to be productive, is going to gel with their own intellectual and methodological approaches to a particular issue. I do think where that we've seen some positive results in a pretty short time from efforts to collaborate. Um, for example, there's a new initiative that some of you may know about to create a global migration group uh, within the United Nations University, which is already in very short order getting visibility and traction in the UN discussions on migration. That's a multi-institute effort to come up with a common research agenda, which each of the institutes will then attack from their own particular angle. That kind of interdisciplinary research is exactly what we could potentially offer that might be of interest to the UN and, and otherwise beyond their reach. So I think there are real opportunities for us here, but it's up to all of you, I think, to figure out how to make that work. 
We can help you find the markets, we can help you sell the products, but you actually are the ones who have to develop the knowledge, ultimately. Um, and I'd add to that on the migration issue, it's very interesting. We have an extremely entrepreneurial director, our only woman director, by the way, but she's outstanding in Barcelona. She has a small team, and she can only succeed by working with others. And it turns out that in the field of migration, there is no dominant international uh, organization. There are a number of international organizations interested, ranging from the High Commissioner for Refugees, the International Organization for Migration, which isn't a UN agency, the International Labor Organization, High Commissioner for Human Rights, you name it. Many involved, but nobody dominant. That's a perfect situation for you and you. And when I went to the meeting of the Global Migration Group, uh, what we found was uh, various agency heads, including both high commissioners, head of the ILO, and so on, tremendously committed to the issue, but without the feeling that their institution was on top of it in any sense. As I say, great opportunity for us. Whereas trying to move into a field where there is a dominant agency which is very territorial uh, is not helpful because that dominant institution that is territorial will devote quite a bit of effort to minimizing the contributions of others and is usually quite successful in uh, minimizing the contribution of others. Any other interventions? Well, if not, please feel free to speak with any of us who were at the council. Francois was there for uh, good periods of time. Uh, Su Ching and uh, Lian from Kuala Lumpur were at the Committee on Administration and Finance. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of how we are administered and how we do uh, take financial management very seriously. Uh, the quality of our human resources as well. Uh, don't hesitate to speak to David, Max, uh, Professor Takeuchi, Jakob Riener, our vice rector uh, outside Japan, was with us for the council, but I think he's leaving later today. You were there pretty well for a good chunk of the council anyway. So don't hesitate to... Uh, whatever you feel is missing in our account, just ask us and we'll be delighted to share it with you. I do hope you'll all read the strategic plan because, by the way, as long as I'm here, I plan to stick to it. So I consider it our marching orders for the next five years, and that's useful for anybody at UNU to know about. Thank you all very much for coming today. It's always great to see you and be with you.